How's it going, everybody? And welcome back. For those of you that it was a quiet weekend, hopefully, and uh, rather enjoyable. I know it was uh, pretty warm here, so I spent quite a bit of time outside. So, anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the comments that have come in recently and try to answer them to try to keep up with them because. Uh, Sometimes they can get a little out of hand, and it's hard to keep up with them, but it's okay. I'd rather you guys ask a bunch of questions, and uh, I have to, you know, shuffle through them until I get them all answered. So, um, so the question about, uh, I have a desktop with max 64 gigs of memory. Not sure if I should just purchase a Dell server instead with 128 gigs of memory so that I can build out the labs before I start. Do you provide support on setting up virtual infrastructure? So anytime you're looking at a very large network diagram that I have in a, uh, that I'm presenting to you, um, the one thing I want to make, I want to be very, very clear here, but also very, uh, um, you don't have to turn the whole thing on. Um, the, uh, the idea of having a very large topology is something that I think is very beneficial to anyone that's starting to get into networking hardcore. Um, so if you're still, um, I think it really helps glue everything together. If you have a large topology and you're working through trying to get everything configured and stuff like that, um, that was kind of the the launching point, if you will, for me, whenever I was studying for the CCIE, I would get to a certain point where I had learned all the individual technologies on a much smaller scale, and I wanted to like prepare myself for what the CCIE lab might actually have. And because I had, hadn't seen it before, I was doing a little bit of research and I found out that the topology was pretty large, you know, 20, 25 devices. So back in 2013, 2014, I was big on creating very large network diagrams in GNS3 and then ESXi, CSR1000Vs attached to a V-switch, and then you know so on and so forth. And the ability to do that um, definitely helped me understand the, uh, the stacking of technologies and really helped glued everything together for me. That's what really was the the point in time where I felt like I went from like a CCMP to a CCIE was being able to visualize something and start to see how it all kind of came together. Um, almost like how if you ever watch Iron Man, I, I don't remember which Iron Man it is, but when um, Tony Stark is, I forget which what he's trying to do, um, it was the, uh, you guys are going to correct me in the comments, but uh, he was busy, he had this like, uh, there was like a model diagram of some sort of rendering that an artist had put together, it was like a mock scale of some like campus building, uh, area of property with a bunch of buildings on it, that eventually became the thing that goes in his chest. And while he was, he had, uh, what was that guy's name that he, I can't even remember the name of the, uh, God, it's escaping me. I feel so stupid right now. But um, he, uh, Jeeves? Anyway, he would ask the computer to, di to like scan and then he would put in the computer and then he'd be able to like blow it up. That's kind of how I describe how I went from learning individual technologies to stacking technologies uh, at a small scale and then being able to take a very large network diagram based off the exam blueprints that I'm seeing and I'm able to take the extrapolate the blueprint topics and then what that might look like in a real world design having done this for a long time that's where a lot of these things come from with that being said any opportunity I get to build something very very large I'm always cognizant of the fact that there's a lot of you out there that, that can't build something that big. And if you, but if you can, I always encourage you to do, to do so. 
because I feel like that's where you really get into the the details and having to think things through. So it's uh, never meant to be a limiting factor for you. That's what I always mention. If you have the opportunity to to do it, to lab something up that big, I always uh, encourage it because it's meant to help you become a better engineer and to get more comfortable with big, uh, bigger topologies, but, uh, more complicated networking and so on and so forth. So that's where this comes into play. So if there's, I'm, I don't help specifically, like I'm not going to hop on a Microsoft Teams call and then do the work for you. You know, there's a, if you're building out a lab, I will point you in the right direction, but really it's up, it's really going to be up to you to go through and learn how to make it all work. That's kind of the point of having your own home lab. So there's always going to be some sort of learning you're going to have to do. So another question is, how about uh, compromise option regarding real life networking courses, WAN portion? Maybe it's possible to do a mix of SD WAN, traditional WAN. Uh, yeah, that, that was okay. So I guess that was my intention was to have a mix of both traditional WAN and SD WAN, and have a uh, like a migration from traditional to SD WAN, and what that would look like, and make it sort of complicated. So. Um, so yeah, good stuff. So weird question that might sound simple but isn't. How do you avoid burnout, especially if you're trying to study a tight schedule study-wise and push yourself for that? I mean, pace yourself. I mean, that's probably the best advice I can give you is don't try to do more than you can. Um, like right now, I have spent the last few days going through an S, uh, a segment routing course on Udemy from Ping Factory, so I can get a better understanding of how segment routing works. And this is basically my first pass of the, the course. So my, I, I do multiple passes over the same information. One is more of a high level, just trying to understand the crux of it, of what's being discussed, what's being explained, what's being demoed, taking notes of how to configure it, and the reality of it is, I'm already familiar with how to configure both IGPs, OSPF and ISIS on XR. And I'm familiar with layer three VPNs. I'm familiar with how MPLS works. So a lot of the major pieces of the course are already well understood by me. So then it's just a matter of getting down to the specifics of how segment routing comes into play with that. So, once I'm done with the course, and I'm, I'm almost there, I think I've got a couple hours left and I'm done, is to then lab it all out. So then it'll be follow along with him in the individual labs that he's built and have the output show up. So that's how you progressively get better and better. As you, every time you go through, you add a little bit more complexity. So it's um, it's meant to every time you go over the course or a set of content I, I never do just one set of content once and I'm done like that's um, I don't know anybody that can do that and pick up all the information the first time and never have to go back I, I don't think that's a reality so I'm a lot like a lot of other people there, there's really nothing special about me and I don't ever like being uh, referred to as somebody that um, is so anything anything but special. So I'm because I'm not. I'm just like everybody else. You know, I'm a normal person with normal life, you know, going on, and I have to make time for what it is that I'm going to do. If that means I have to stay up late because I had other obligations, then that's what I have to do. If that means I have to forego. Um, doing something that might be cool because I'd rather study, then those are the sacrifices that I have to make. So I try to be as, especially when you're, you know, you, I don't know if, if you have family, stuff like that, you have to, you know, put your priorities in order. So 
Um, that's a lot of stuff that you just have to prioritize and execute. And the only way, uh, the only way that you avoid burnout is is pacing yourself. I, I can't really say any, say it any other way than that because that's the, the reality of it. If you need to take a break, take a break. Um, you know, tight uh, tight s- schedule for study. Uh, I guess everybody's kind of in that boat, and you have to make time for what's important. So, you know, it's uh, nine. 10 years ago, yeah, probably, uh, my wife and I had a discussion about me going after CCIE. And so we came to a common agreement where I would spend as much time as possible just studying. So she would take over doing everything. Um, that meant that uh, garbage, like all the household stuff, I, she took me off of having to do anything she would handle it all. And in the short term, in that period of time, that six, 12, 18 month period of time, she, she took on more responsibility for that. But the long term goal was that that wouldn't be the forever. Like it wasn't one of those things where 15 years later, for example, she's still doing the, uh, she's, uh, she's not the only one doing chores around the house. I mean, it's, it's a family affair, right? Where we all pitch in, but it's one of those things where we had that discussion and we came to a common agreement. So we both made compromises. I would spend as much time doing, you know, studying and things like that, to try to get me over the finish line, which it, it, it did exactly what it was supposed to do. I spent as much time as I could and it paid off. You know, I was eventually able to pass. Um, and then over time, it just, you know, uh, all the things that she had been doing slowly tapered into me helping with everything else. So it was one of those things where, you know, if you're going to be diving into uh, certification, unless you're single and you've got nobody else to worry about or anybody else relying on you for something, then you've got nothing to worry about. But if you're like me and you have, you know, wife, kids, I have a full-time job, I have responsibilities and obligations to family and to my job and other things, I, if that only leaves me uh, an hour, an hour and a half to do what I got to do, well then that's the amount of time that I have to do what I have to do and I spend the time doing that. So I don't make excuses, I don't complain, I don't uh, throw a fit or have a temper tantrum. I do what I gotta do, take it like a man and get after it, you know, and that's what you gotta do. I mean, there's really no no other, uh, I don't make excuses for falling short of my goals. I, I reassess when it comes to a certain point, like, okay, is this working? And if it's not, I make adjustments. That's really what it comes down to it. So um, that's how I would do handle that. Uh, to me, burnout is, isn't really a thing. Um, so you just have to prioritize and execute. And if it's if you are getting hung up, it's one thing. It's one thing to try to study too many things at one time. So if you're putting, if you have ten things that you're trying to do, and you're putting ten percent of your effort into each one of those things at any given time, you're going to be, make very little progress in any one of those one areas because you're only putting a little bit of effort in. However, if you shorten that up to one or two things and you're prioritized and you're putting in much more effort, you're going to make more progress. Um, so that's the, the best advice I can give you is don't overcommit yourself to anything. Don't be afraid to say, no, I can't do that. Um, I used to, I do that now. Like if somebody comes to me and says, hey, can you handle this? I'm like, if I can, I do. But if I can't, I'm like, sorry, I've got too much uh, on my plate right now. And I need to balance that out because 
I've done that in the past. Early on in my career, I was definitely a yes man. Sure, I'll, I'll take that on. I would work this 50, 60, 70 hours a week in order to get that done. But now that I'm much older and much wiser, it's just like, nah, I really don't have the, the bandwidth to handle that right now, especially with the, the amount of projects that I'm working now and the deadlines that those projects have. I can't take any more on without the potential of dropping other projects and deadlines getting missed and then upset customers. So I, I can't afford to do that. So, and if you learn how to marshal your resources, I think that's gonna be huge. And that's gonna make you that much better, in my opinion. Um, you said that the Cisco online documents RFCs are absolutely mandatory. So what are the steps, for example, for a CCMP Encore course plan? Lectures, OCG, labbing yourself, workbooks, workbook for the labs, then is this enough? Or do I have to study Cisco online documents or documents and RFCs too? Yeah, sure, all of the above. Whatever you have to do so that when you're going through the, the blueprint and you're trying to go through all the different topics, if you have to go read an RFC to understand how something works, then do what you gotta do. That's part of the, the learning game. They're, the official certification guide, they're good, but they're not all encompassing. They're not gonna cover everything. Um, they'll do a, good, a decent job, but if you're, let's say, I, I, I don't wanna use this as a, as a litmus test, but if you were to just read the official certification guide and do nothing else, I would hate for you to go blow the money on this, but if you want to lab, if you want to test a theory, go grab the official cert guide for Encore, go read it cover to cover, and don't do anything but read that. That would be your one study resource. Then once you've read it cover to cover, and you can, you know, you understand everything that's in that book. I don't know how many pages the thing is. I guess around a thousand. Then go sit for the Encore exam and see how you do. And if you pass, great. If you fail, it's going to be blatantly obvious to, to you when you go sit for the exam whether or not you learned enough in the book. How do I know that? Well, because you're going to be presented with questions and you may or may not know how to con to do to answer the question you know the, the the wording of the question maybe the exhibit the the network diagram or the the output that's given to you for you to reference and then the answers to the question that you've been presented if you can't answer or you don't know what you're looking at but you read the book cover to cover and you understood everything that was in the book then that wasn't enough. So what I recommend everybody do is, especially when you're going for Encore, which is, this is the written exam for the CCIE for both enterprise infrastructure and enterprise wireless. I always recommend that you go and you look up the CCIE exam. Uh, and what you do is you come over here to enterprise infrastructure, you go to additional resources, and you look at the equipment and software list. And what it's gonna tell you to do, it's gonna tell you which versions of code that you need to go look at. And so what you would do then is you would start, is you would grab this version of code for the CAT-8 case, which iOS XE 17.9. I would look at iOS for 15.8. I'd look at Catalyst switches for 15.2 code, SD-WAN 20.9. DNA Center 2.3, the CAT 9300, the and they're running the same version of code. I would take a look at ICE 3.1, and what I would start doing is I would start reading through the documentation. Go to the actual configuration guides for each version of code for each platform you see here, and if you go through that and you read this, plus you read through the, the official certification guide, but don't go configure anything. See if you can pass the test. 
Now, the, the reason I, I say it that way is to be more kind of sarcastic. Of course, do go through as many study resources as you need to so that when you get to the exam, you're not caught off guard. If you need to take another six months to go through the material so that you're comfortable, if you go through the, blue, the exam blueprint, if I look at, let me go back here, go back one. If I look at the blueprint, so let's, let's break this out real quick. If I look at the blueprint here for enterprise infrastructure, what is the goal of looking at everything? The goal of looking at everything, being able to look at the individual blueprint topics. If there's something on here that you don't know what it means, don't know how it works, that means that you need to go do some research and dig into it. That's how you become an expert, is knowing how everything on the blueprint works, being able to identify what they are, how it comes into play, that's caveats, lab up as much as you can, so that when you finally do get to the, the core encore exam, you're not caught off guard. The, the worst feeling in the world is when you're sitting in an exam and you get presented with a question and you have no clue how to answer it. Because then you just feel like you pissed $400 away. Well, why didn't I study that? Well, maybe you didn't know to study that. But now, by going through the exam, because it's like, how is, then is this enough? Well, you've done everything in, up to that point to study for it. You, you read the documentation. You read the official certification guide. You've labbed up everything that you could on the Encore exam. And then, so to, to be honest with you, the... The Encore exam is, uh, you really should be studying for the lab, the practical, everything, every one of these blueprint topics, you should actually be studying and taking a look at, uh, if you look back over here at the equipment and software list, it doesn't specifically call out wireless, but if you look at Encore, then let's go grab that real quick. If you grab Encore, and you look at the exam details, the exam is going to have an infrastructure. There's going to be some wireless in here. So guess what? You're going to have to go read up on wireless. So that means that you're going to have to go understand how wireless controllers work because it's the core exam. So that's one of those things where, I don't know, maybe it's not possible for you to lab it up. But going back to your question, how, is, how do you know if that's enough? By going through the exam blueprint and looking at everything, can you identify everything that's on this blueprint and know how it works and configure it if you need to? Then maybe you've done enough. Then it's time for you to go sit for the test. And if you get presented with a question that you don't know how to answer, that you know, I would look at what it's talking about and you can get a rough idea of what topic that came thing that came from maybe you got four or five questions that you didn't know how to answer however it was not enough questions missed meaning you missed those five questions you missed them you didn't get the points for them but you still passed the test do you still does that still qualify as something you need to go study for if you are going after the lab, then I'd say yes. You know, and what's it going to hurt taking another couple of days or when you get home, you look up those specific topics just so you're generally familiar with what they are. So hopefully that answers your question because this can be a lot to take on. So I answered that one. Uh, yep, we're going to definitely add that in for the Internet Edge design. I like this stuff that goes along with that. Okay. Uh, let's see here. And based on your last answer, if I understand correctly, it's UDP hello mechanism that causes HSRP to go to the backup router. Stand with trick one. Is the above is the above configuration supposed to do a pseudo SD WAN type scenario? Of course, after adding the IPSLA config, that if there is 
Packet drops, the HSRP will shift to the backup. How do I tell the router if there are packet drops, switch to the backup? How do I translate packet drops into IP, SLA, ICMP echo? But then how would the router know how much percent of packet drops is too much is too much and would shift to the backup? Okay. Stop what you're doing. I'm going to be straight up with you. You need to go learn HSRP. If you understood HSRP, even at a basic level, you would not be asking questions like this. No BS. If I had somebody come to me uh, and with this, uh, just like this, the way you're asking this question tells me you don't know, what, you don't know what thing about HSRP. So you need to pump the brakes and go read the documentation and understand HSRP. Because if you did, even at a basic level, you would already know that that is how HSRP works is by UDP port 1985 between the devices, whether it's routers or switches on a per SVI ba basis, because it's, that's how HSRP works with different groups, you would be able to, um, you'd understand that already. So that's where that comes into play. Um, so, okay, so HSRP with IPSLA is not SD-WAN, not even pseudo SD-WAN. Um, so I think you, I think, I, I have to be, sometimes I have to be careful with how I answer questions here because, you know, you're, you're putting the cart before the horse. A, you don't understand HSRP. B, you don't understand how IPSLA works. And C, you're trying to understand how to take IPSLA and tracking associated with HSRP to track something that really isn't trackable and then have it fail over. So you need to go back to the beginning of Encore. And where is it? Right here. You need to spend a... A ma uh, 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 spend a couple of days going through the basics of HSRP and how it works because in that particular case based off the way you're wording your question you're trying to make something do something it's not meant to do so the reality of IPSLA is to track an, uh, the reachability of an IP address that's what most of your deployments are going to be. Do not confuse how SD-WAN is able to take a look at things like latency, delay, and jitter. Take those into consideration when it's looking at uh, the probes that it sends out to see how stable or how utilized the link is before it makes a decision to for traffic over a particular SD-WAN tunnel and then fail over to another one, or split the traffic off based off of priority, or QoS marking, or whatever the case might be. So SD-WAN is meant to be much more sensitive to those things than, and you're, you're not gonna make any IPSLA probe uh, be able to do that. So the very simple thing is, IPSLA is going to test is going to send a ping out a particular interface or a, out, it's going to send IPSLA echoes to a particular IP address or a group of IP addresses. And if at a given period of time, which it's a interval and a threshold, if I send three pings and then they are all missed, then fail over, which means you're going to tie that SLA instance because it's just an operation. It's just a ping. You're going to associate that to a track the tracking is going to then, if SLA goes down because the pings fail, uh, uh, ICMP echoes aren't received back, you get ICMP timeouts. SLA fails, tracking will fail because SLA failed. And then because of that, if you've done your HSRP configuration correctly, you're gonna add a decrement command to your tracking to decrement a certain amount of the priority from your primary router. 
that particular primary router is going to de decrement say 30. So you're going to go from a 120 down to a 90. And then because of that, you're going to have preemption configured on the other router. So the what's the backup router will have a priority of 100. With SLA failing, the decrement of 30 from 120 means that the primary is now going to be a 90. Higher priority always wins. It fails over to the backup. That's as simple as it gets. Can you make it more complicated? Yes. Why would you do that? I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me. If there's a specific use case, I, I've literally never had a customer in the 15 years that I've been doing this. I've never had a customer try to overly complicate something that has been done time and time and time again. So you need to spend some time, and, and, and anybody really for this matter, not just you, that doesn't understand how this works, you need to go back to the basics of understanding how HSRP works at its core foundation. And once you've done that, then you'll be able to understand why it is set up the way that it's set up. So in the real world networking course, then I'll be uh, starting here soon. It's not, I'm, I'm not working on getting it ready anytime soon because I'm trying to get other stuff done before that. But you're, you, you don't translate IPSLA of packet drops into ICMP echo. You, you, you don't, that's not what it's meant for. Now there might be a specific operation that would let you uh, do something similar to that. However, SLAs are service level agreements. These are meant for you to send synthetic traffic, whether it's you're trying to make the packet look like it is a voice call with a specific codec attached to it and you're sending it over the wire with uh let's say uh, g711 u law for a voice codec you're trying to send it over the wire so that you're hitting qos values somewhere else in the network and they're triggered so there are some things that you could you know simulate through an sla but the reality of it is that's not how this is going to work for pseudo SD WAN. Don't don't try to confuse um, failing over from your primary to your backup router as how SD WAN works, because every high availability scenario does the exact same. Uh, works in that manner. If you're doing SD WAN, there's some higher level stuff going on that the SD WAN functionality is going to do. Application aware routing. It is very possible to send specific applications out of a particular tunnel to uh, because MPLS is going to have a better SLA than internet. Just the nature of the beast. So that's how I'm going to answer that question. I, I'm, if, I, if I'm coming off like a jerk or uh, yeah, it is what it is. I'm based off the way your question is being worded. You don't know that much about HSRP and you need to go back to the basics on that and test it out. So it's one th I have no problem answering questions and trying to give you a high level of understanding, but here's the thing. What I don't want to do is make these type of videos your core learning. That's not what these are meant for. These are, hey, I've got this scenario, or based off your experience, how would you handle this situation, or what did you do in that? Some of the other questions, like the questions you were doing a couple weeks ago. Let me see if I can't find one. Um, let's see here. So stuff like this, these are great questions, right? Because you're, you know, you're, you're trying to take what I've put together here. Mm, excuse me. You're trying to take some of this stuff and, uh, dig into a specific thing and, um, so some of your questions are good, but some of the other questions I can tell there is some, some novice and some beginner level understanding or lack thereof. So, um, you know, you're asking questions. I'm going to give you real answers. I'm not going to sit there and be like, you know, uh, I'm going to be straight up with you. So, and it's only meant to make you better, right? It's not meant to be, I'm not trying to be a, a jerk about it. 
So, because uh, if I'm coming off that way, you know, it's it's kind of that's how I am. I'm I'm a straight shooter. I don't BS people. Um, I will point you in the right direction to help you try to become better. But um, so I've been told I can be a little gruff and insensitive sometimes, and it's like, all right, well, either, either you like it or you don't. I'm not. I don't change for anybody. So, um, so what my corrective construction criticism would for you would be to go uh, learn HSRP a little better. Make sure you understand how that works. And so, because this answer right here, based on your last answer, if I understand correctly, it's UDP hello mechanism that causes HSRP to go to the backup router. Well, yes, that is the case, but you should already know that. If you understand HSRP and how it operates, you should already know that's how it works. That's why the way you're asking that question, I can tell you have a very basic understanding. If, if, uh, it, and it needs to go further. Now, I'll leave it at that. I don't want to pick on you any longer than that. So, um, I know this is getting a little long, but uh, what I do want to mention is I have, um, where is it? Do I have it out and up? I think it's this one. Yeah, let's go ahead and add it over here. Um, I might have to re yeah, refresh. Mm, excuse me. Okay, yep, here we go. So this is our topology for the the Encore and an RC course, or a workbook, I should say, not course. Um, I was tempted to just do some Encore specific to, to, um, technologies, uh, specifically focusing on uh, EIGRP or uh, OSPF, BGP, uh, stuff like that. But as I was going through it, there's only like... 10 or 15 things that it really calls out. And I was like, you know what? It, it only makes more sense to do it this way. And there's another question. Why am I doing, why don't I have links in between here and here connecting C, C3 to D2 or fully mesh the core? Uh, simple. Um, this isn't the real world networking course for one. And number two, um, it's Encore or uh, Encore and an RC. So I was just trying to make it easier to follow along. And, you know, assuming there are folks coming from CCNA working their way towards CCNP, and I wanted to make it very evident as to what's going on. So I have more, uh, more like notation to put in here, like NAT here, NAT inside, NAT outside, um, hub, um, what we're going to be doing in certain areas, uh, stuff like that to try to make it more evident as what we're doing. So uh, that's where that comes into play. So the workbook is gonna begin here very soon, um, probably in the next, I've, I've actually got it started. Um, I've actually started the, the crux to it, but I wanted to get everything configured, or I, I'm sorry, everything powered up first so that I can get an idea of utilization. Actually, let me close the lab real quick because I don't think I have any other labs working right now. No, I don't. Uh, so if I look at system status, I'm using 9%, 8% of my CPU and 2% of 500 gigs. So if I do some quick math on that real quick, let's pull up calculator. I pull up the calculator and I say I've got 504 gigs of RAM. So 504 divide that by 2%, is percent an option here? I might have to go to scientific. Uh, no, you know what, I know how to do it now. So let's go back to standard. So we're gonna say, uh, actually this one's got 512. 512, divide that by 0 0.02, oh, uh, 512 times 0 0.02, uh, 10 gigs of RAM, roughly, is what it's taking. And these CPUs are E7, 
I believe they're E7 4870s. Uh, let me see here real quick if I can't find. Um, no, that's not what I'm looking for. I was going to see if I can't find. The I think it was E seven. Let me go Intel Arc E seven uh forty eight seventy. Yeah, I think this is what I had. I'm ninety nine percent sure this is what I had. Yep. Yeah, uh, E7 4870s. So this is taking uh, number of CPUs is 80. I'm taking 10% of that. So if we take, let's do some math then. So it's uh, it's about 10-ish uh, gigs of RAM. So if we take a look at, and we're at 7, 8% CPU. Let's go back to main. Let's look at an RC series. And then open it up. We take... Um, so when I get it fully, uh, fully everything powered on, let's say it's 12 gigs, 12 gigs of RAM. Now this is nothing running on it, by the way. There's nothing running. There's no services, no uh, no routing protocols. So I would assume it's going to go up probably five gigs, six gigs. So roughly 24, I'd say. I'm, I'm going to like double or give you more than what's there. So if we take um, if you take, it's going to be 2.4 times 40 comes out to 96 gigahertz. And if I divide that by 10, I'm going to come up with 9.6 gigs of CPU. So if I do the math on that, that's going to come out to what? Eight, eight V CPUs. Yeah, I'd say eight CPUs. So eight CPUs and 24 gigs of RAM is what this one will, and I'll respond to one of the questions, is what this will run. Now, mind you, none of these PCs, none of these PCs are running either, by the way. So I think 24 gigs of RAM and uh, eight CPUs on a decent size processor, you should be okay. So if you're, that's what I think this will run. That's just an estimate though. I really don't know. Um, and this is a bare metal install as well. So that's why I'm, it's barely making the server sweat. So um, hopefully that answers your question, but that's where this comes into play. So uh, there's a lot that goes into this. So, um, so yeah, if you guys have any other questions when it comes to that, I'm planning on putting in um, like I've got the uh, let's see here. I have the, like, this is as far as I've gotten with the book. I'm like, I've titled it. That's as far as I've gotten. So uh, what I will begin doing here is um, getting everything booted up that matters. And then there will be a, a big dedicated section for the IP addressing. Anything that's going to have an IP address will be done. Um, like infrastructure devices, all this stuff will be IP addressed um, ahead of time where, and if there's anything like SBIs or tunnels and things like that, those will be done when we get to that point. So as we go along, the main pieces that are going to get configured will be done so appropriately. So you'll have IP addressing for a lot of stuff, but then when we get into things like, you know, the VLANs and the trunking and the spanning tree and SBIs and HSRP and um, port channels and all that type of stuff that'll all be configured at uh, anything that needs to be added those things will be added at those t at those points in time and I'm gonna try to remember to add that in the book that it'll be sectioned so it's easier to follow so at least that's the that's the point so and I'm gonna I've got everything uh, put into blocks so that it when we get to a particular area we'll be like okay do XYZ here so this will be like a multi area OSPF design so it's like, okay, so am I going to start here? 
Probably not. I'm probably going to start in other areas. Um, only because of the fact that they're smaller. Like, okay, do like layer two networking. I might start over here and get some basic layer two networking done there or do it over here. You know, something along those lines. And then we'll work our way up to the bigger, more complicated stuff just so that it's more of a crawl, walk, run kind of approach. At least that, that's my goal with it. So if you guys have any questions, concerns, comments, that type of stuff, leave a comment in the section in the comment section below. I will have a link for the Patreon link for the members if you want to join the channel, and, but you can't join through YouTube. I'll have a link to the sample workbook and the actual workbook in the description. And until next time, guys, uh, and I will get the, the post out for Whiteboard Wednesday and for the coaching session on Friday. With that being said, I want to thank you guys for stopping by and hanging out with me. And until next time, guys, take it easy.